Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, August 27, 2024. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to be led by Ms. Chika Kalu. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fi Fios Channel 34. In order to, to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the August 27th agenda. Dr. Rogers, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am unaware of any changes to this evening's agenda. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matters that affects one or more specific individuals, and to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The closed session summary and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that, I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves, and certificate appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D4? So, so moved, Lichter. Do I have a second? Second, Harvey. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Tomanowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Rempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chica Kalu? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Madam Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and members of the board, I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Assistant Principal, Hereford High School, and Supervisor, Student Data Systems, Department of Application and Network security support system. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibit E1? So moved, Stileski. Do I have a second? Second, Savoy. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Domanowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chikakalu? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Turn it over to Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Our first appointment this evening is Helen Doa. Please stand. <laughs> Helen is attending this evening with her husband, Malcolm Davis, if you can please stand as well, and is being appointed as Supervisor Student Data Systems in the Department of Application and Network Security Support Services. With four years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experience include Senior Student Information Reporting Analyst in the Department of Application and Network Security Support Services. Prior to that, she served as Coordinator and ad of Admissions, Compliance, and Transition Specialist at the Kennedy Krieger Institute. Congratulations. Next appointment this evening is Janet Sovich. Please stand. 
Janet is attending this evening with her husband, Randy, and is being appointed as the assistant principal at Hereford High School. With 15 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her experiences include instrumental music teacher at Scotts Branch Elementary, Bedford Elementary, Parkville High, and Hereford High School. Prior to that, she served as an instrumental music teacher in Prince George's County Public Schools and a lead music teacher in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Congratulations. Congratulations to all of our um, appointees. We know you're gonna do great things in Baltimore County Public Schools. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. If not selected to address the board, members of the public may submit their comments to the, to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. The Baltimore County Police Department's Homeland Security Unit and Office of School Safety has recommended safety and security protocols, which are posted in the board room and available on board docs and on the board's participation by the public website. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. Inappropriate personal, personal remarks or other behavior, such as language that promotes violence against a BCPS employee or that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order and will not be tolerated. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. Please observe the three minute clock which will let you know when your time is up. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time or prior to that at the discretion of the board chair. So our first group are the school system affiliated groups and our first speaker is Ms. Marlena Colton Persil. Sal. And she is with the Southwest Area Education Advisory Council. Greetings, board chair, Superintendent Rogers, and board members. For the record, my name is Marlena Colleton Purcell, the chair of the Southwest Education Advisory, excuse me, Southwest Area Education Advisory Council. I will be brief tonight um, so that we can reclaim our time with our families. It is my hope that everyone had a great summer and we are ready for an awesome school year. Um, here is my one minute elevate, elevated pitch for our families, parents, guardians, stakeholders, and community members. Our school system, BCPS, has an awesome mission for our council. It reads, to improve the quality of education in Baltimore County and to strengthen the relationships between the school and community by serving as informed advisors to the Board of Education to, on issues that affect students, families, communities, and schools. I raise to you tonight, you have three goals. Engage, empower, excel. Did I get it right? So I raise to you tonight, families, please, this is a new school year. I'm empowering you to find out more about the area, area education advisory councils. Perhaps attend a meeting. Perhaps this might be your time to become a free member. There's free membership, guys. Um, so let your voice be heard more so than at the kitchen table or the parking lot. Let your voice be heard at a meeting. Next, engage. I'm hoping that you take the advice here tonight and be more engaged. We need you. Hopefully you can attend two meetings, two PTA meetings, two board meetings, two family events, two events that your child is being showcased, or two legislative assembly meetings. I'm hoping that this year becomes your a year of engagement. And then last but not least, Excel. We can do better. Our kids deserve it. Be the advocate for your kids or your community. Let the past be the past. Put it down. We need to move forward. This is going to be a great school year. We meet the second Mondays of each month. Please look out for the topics of issues on uh, topics that we have. You can attend any area education advisory council. Um, it doesn't have to be yours. There's five of them. And um, I'm welcoming you. That's it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Ramona Basilio. 
Basilio um, from the Baltimore County PTA. Good evening, Chair, um, Superintendent Rogers, member of the board. My name, what you've heard, is Ramona Basilio. I am with the Baltimore County PTA. I bring greetings from our board and our over 130 units who work together with parents, students, and teachers throughout Baltimore County. I come here also to share um, our deep appreciation for the work that you do, you have done, and your work over the summer. We know that you've been working hard over the summer because we've been attending your many events and your many trainings, and we appreciate all that you do. We believe that everyone in this group and in this room wakes up every morning with the interest of our 100,000 students at heart. May I disagree on the way we're gonna get there, but at the end of the day, we're interested in the health, welfare, and self safety of our children. Now, I wanna elevate the conversation of cell phones. One of the things that the PTA Council is involved in is the cell phone campaign. Now, some folks probably say, oh, well, we can do that. But what I wanna do is have a conversation with families and parents. We feel that the whole issue of social media, social responsibility, safety, is part of a four-legged stool. BCPS is doing its part through Off and Away, through the pilot study, through research, through committing um, support resources. The police department and law enforcement is doing their part in terms of passing legislation, dealing with cyberbullying, dealing with Grace's Law, et cetera. Now we need the students and the parents to step up. Interesting enough, one of my council members said just last night she had a difficult time getting her child off the phone. And I said, why? She said, I really think my child is addicted. So in 2000, 2008, there was a study, and I remember that study, it talked about addiction. Pay attention, families. Listen to your child. Understand that turning off that phone is more challenging than you think. Just say no is not working. In order for off and away to work, we need all hands on board. We need parents to stop calling your kids during the day, asking how their day is going. We need children to get off the phones. We need teachers to teach. A teacher cannot spend all her time or his time monitoring children on the phone. Please, let's be responsible parents. Let's be responsible adults. The children need our leadership for their health, safety, and welfare. Let's work with this cell phone issue. It is going to be a major issue of the future. Now is the time for us to get in front of it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Phil Stoller from the Northwest Area Education Advisory Council. Good evening. Ms. Chair, Dr. Rogers, and all board members. I know I've met some of you previously, but I wanted to come tonight to introduce myself to uh, the rest of you. Uh, my name is Phil Stoller. I'm the chairperson of the Northwest Area Education Advisory Council. Monica Walton Walker is the vice chair, and you'll meet her at another time. Our plan for this year is to hold informative meetings every month as best we can on a variety of topics. In fact, we're planning right now, hopefully, one will be, the first one will be on electronic personal devices, including cell phones. The other main goal will be to recruit members. And if there's any ideas you have that you can give to us for the best way to do this, um, that would be appreciated. And then we can take those ideas and put them into practice. And I or someone from the council will try to attend every board meeting. Don't know if that's gonna be possible. Uh, we've lost a few members over the past few years. Uh, they are not uh, with us anymore. And so Marlena sort of covered more passionately than I did everything. But um, I just wanted to introduce myself. If there's, I know there's usually not any dialogue 
but if you um, had any questions, um, feel free, and I'll be here the whole meeting, so if you want to ask any questions then afterwards, thank you for your time. Thank you. Next are our unions, and um, we have Miss Cindy Sexton from TABCO. Good evening, Chair Ms. Booker-Dwyer, Vice Chair Ms. Pumphrey, Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Seeing our students and staff back at school is always an exciting time. First day visits yesterday were full of hope and promise. It's such a great way to start the school year. As we are starting another school year, I want to first speak to all the educators. Please be sure that you are planning lessons for your students, but while you're doing that and also trying to juggle your work home balance and the countless other tasks that educators do every single day, remember that your mental, emotional, and physical health are also a priority. We know anxiety is high for some and it's important to take care of you. Take care of you so you will have the ability to do all the other things too. We are here for our students. Focus on the positives they bring to your classroom and focus on the why you got into teaching. I continue to be grateful for the work that TABCO and BCPS did collaboratively around our three-year contract, but also for the work we continue to do to address situations and concerns as they arise, including as recently as late this afternoon. Uh, when we work together in true collaboration, we can accomplish great things. I look forward to seeing our students and all the staff who work with them and for them as I visit schools throughout the school year. Thank you all and have a great school year. Thank you. Next are our individual citizens or students and um, our first speaker is Ms. Sharon Saroff. Evening, Chairwoman Booker Dwyer and uh, Dr. Rogers and board members. I am here to do a reminder um, that there are two items that do not belong in the same sentence one size fits all and IEP. IEP stands for Individualized Education Plan. And having the word individual in there automatically negates having a one-size-fits-all policy. I'm going to bring up cell phones because that has come to my attention so far in at least one IEP meeting last week. And it's coming into my attention in the IEP meetings I have tomorrow and Thursday. Yes, I have IEP meetings the first week of school. That's ridiculous. Um, cell phones, yes, we use them for social media. Students with special needs use them for other things. They are devices used for communication in the classroom. If I'm not comfortable talking in front of a group of people, I have an app on my phone and I can put down some information that goes directly to my teacher. I have a student that has that app. And right now we are fighting to get that phone on the IEP so that it doesn't get taken away from her. I have a student who uses her phone to take pictures of her notes because she has problems hearing information in the classroom. Yes, her IEP does say she is supposed to have copies of her notes, but that doesn't always happen. And she's a high schooler and she needs to take pictures. I think we need to be cognizant of the fact that when we make policies, and I said this this morning on the state level, one size does not fit all. Mm. Students with IEPs are individuals, and we have to keep that in mind when we do special education and we do policies in general. Thank you. 
Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Mr. Burns. Oh, by, oh sorry. Nope, wait, we have one more individual citizen, uh, Dr. Bosch Perot. Good evening to all, with liberty and justice for all. I honestly believe if my name is John Donahue or Smith, I would not have been ejected from the school system on July 9th. So just a reminder, the ugly people in the uncivil era of the United States pushed Rosa Park to go back in the bus. In reality, the school system got me out of the bus completely for no justifiable reason. So I flew Alaska Airline, and half an hour in the air, the pilot allowed us to stand up, walk around, stretch, move around, nobody threw me outside the window. And if you think too, you know, in the DNC, there were many people standing up and Secret Service didn't throw them out. So pilot and captain and superintendent, please, I ask you to take that ugly sign on my left down. It makes you not secure, it makes no sense, it's humiliating to the public, and just doesn't belong there. All right, I'd like to celebrate Marlena coming today, and the other gentleman, I'm sorry, I don't know the name yet, but just ask yourself, how many times you seen chairs of the councils come to you? All right, I used to be in the central area. Do you know the name of the central area chair? Do you know the members? Do you know what they are doing? When have you seen her before, Northeast? When have you seen him before? If you look at the website, it really doesn't, it's not easy to find the, the EAX, the educational area, but when you look at the schedule, you see all areas are blank for 24, 25, except for the Southeast. And I really admire the Southeast a whole lot for that, a very unique, even though she doesn't come here, Jackie doesn't come here, but she works like a bulldozer, like a, a very hardworking person, very meaning person. So why am I saying this? I think the educational councils are a failure I think you as a system need to put it in the forefront and address it. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session and for that I call on Mr. Burns. Madam Chair, Dr. Rogers, members of the board, for the record, Darren Burns, board attorney. I'm reporting to you on the action you took in closed session regarding uh, hearing examiner case 24-31 and seek your action in affirming the action you took in closed session. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's case 2431 and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present? So moved, Celeste. May I have a second? Second, Lichter. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frampong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Abstain. Ms. Chikakalu? Yes. Ms. Valeski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Booker-Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. 
The next item on the agenda is consideration of the FY 2025 Office of Internal Audit Work Plan, and for that, I call on Ms. Barr. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Rogers, and all Board of Education members. Policy 8400 describes the role and responsibility of the Office of Internal Audit and indicates that I am to develop and present a broad, comprehensive internal audit work plan that is reviewed and approved annually by the Board's Audit Committee by June 30 of each fiscal year. The work plan is to be developed as defined in the Institute of Internal Auditors International Professional Practices Framework using a risk-based risk methodology. This work plan should include a focused single-year plan as well as a, an informational long-range plan. My focus this evening and the request for your consideration and approval is on the FY25 work plan. Before we develop our work plan, we complete our annual risk assessment that includes the identification of process owners, notification to executive leadership and process owners of the risk assessment process, meeting with all new process owners, the review of the superintendent's priorities as well as the Maryland blueprint, the consideration of feedback received from the audit committee, the superintendent, the superintendent's cabinet, and for this year, 57 different process owners. The process owners identified and presented their key functions in the school system to our office. The review and classification of 530 key functions as high, medium, or low. This year, we identified 124 high, 209 medium, and 197 low risk key functions throughout the school system, as well as updating our risk ratings in Teammate, our audit software package. Once the risk assessment is complete, we begin the development of our work plan. As part of that development, we consider several variables. The board's goals of accountability, transparency, and improved student outcomes, the superintendent's priorities on academic achievement, infrastructure, safety and climate, and highly effective teachers, leaders, and staff. Additionally, this plan also aligns with the Maryland Blueprint pillars. Our office goals of integrity, quality, and efficiency, the number of available staff resource hours, deferred projects from prior years, the prior year long-range plan, and identified risk levels. This work plan includes audits related to internal controls, compliance, and processes that each division uses to achieve their mission and goals that contribute to the overall accomplishments of the school system. The audits will identify risks that may prevent their success and offer recommendations to mitigate risk. Additionally, we monitor the fraud, waste, and abuse hotline and complete investigations related to those areas. Any non-fraud, waste, or abuse allegations are sent to the superintendent's office for review and disposition. This work plan will allow us to focus our limited resources on audit activities that will provide recommendations to the process owners to help mitigate identified risks. It is important to note that a risk-based audit plan is fluid so that emerging risks and unplanned projects that require immediate attention can be addressed. In accordance with policy 8430, the audit committee reviewed and approved the FY25 work plan at its meeting held on June 28, 2024, and is bringing it to the board this evening for its approval. I thank you for your time and attention this evening, and I would be happy to answer any board member questions about the FY25 work plan at this time. Thank you, Ms. Barr. Are there any questions from the board? Madam Chair, Ms. I have one. This uh, is Ms. Penn. Uh, Ms. Penn, I'll get you right after Ms. Harvey. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Barr, for providing uh, this information. Uh, this is, uh, my questions are more for my, my education as to the, to the work of the, of the um, internal audit division. Uh, first, I noticed that in the, pro in the, uh, the FY25 plan that the objectives are labeled as tentative. Can you explain why they're tentative and is if, if they change, is there a process to get those changes approved? Certainly. Um, they're tentative because we have to typically meet with the process owners to gain more information about the areas that we're auditing. So they provide us that information and if it's aligned with the objective that is tentative, we would move ahead with that objective. So oftentimes, um, based on the information that's provided to us, we have to shift the objective. And sometimes uh, we learn that 
other external agencies uh, heavily monitor the area. So at that point in time, we would actually write a memo to, to not do that project um, this fiscal year, and that would be presented to the Audit Committee for its review and approval. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the focus areas are not necessarily based on uh, data or information of concern that we've already identified and said, hey, we want an audit of this because we think that we can improve this process. It is uh, spec speculative or prospective. So we, we meet with the process owners. We, we send a survey out. Uh, initially, when we started the risk assessment process, we met with over 400 and some process owners, 483 process owners. And each year, we update the risk assessment process. So we have uh, variables that, that we submit to those process owners, and then they identify their levels of risk from their opinion um, on, on their key processes and key functions. And then we take that information and then the information and experience that we have in our office, we either adjust that score up or down and then, it, then that determines whether it is a high, medium, or low risk. And then we take into consideration our office goals as well as the superintendent's priorities, the board's goals, and this year uh, we, we align to the Maryland Blueprint as well. So it, it is a very, um, time-consuming process and a very involved process, and based on the identification of risk, um, that is how we come up with the audit focus areas. And then my last question. You have, um, I believe I read in here that there were some projects or focus areas that were carrying over from the previous year? Correct, because of the timing of when the audit was started. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that that would naturally just carry over into the into this fiscal year. Okay. So given and is carryover normal? Do we yes, it normally is. have carryover? Yes. Has there been any consideration to adjusting uh, the audits, the, the volume, the number of audits that we select, or reprioritizing them so that we can complete an audit cycle without having carryover? That's under heavy consideration for this upcoming years, not for the FY25 plan, but for the FY2016, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Hen? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, Ms. Barr. Good evening. Um, thank you for presenting on your work plan. I appreciate your time this evening um, and, and for laying this out so clearly for us. My question has to do um, with the same topic as Ms. Harvey had been asking about with regards to prioritization and the inclusion of certain projects over the exclusion of others. And the projects are labeled according to the superintendent's priorities. And I imagine some um, decisions had to be made with regards to which projects were included versus which were excluded. And my question is when you performed that risk assessment, um, was that the ultimate determining factor in terms of which projects um, ultimately were included in the final work plan? Or can you speak to um, that decision tree in terms of um, the final work plan and, and how you prioritized or, or made that decision in terms of which projects were included? Can you speak to that a little bit more? Sure. If you don't mind. Sure. As I, as I mentioned, we, we went through the risk assessment process, uh, get, gathering the information from process owners, feedback from uh, uh, executive leadership, and then what we do uh, based on the scores and information provided by them, we apply our knowledge uh, based on perhaps uh, uh, a trend in investigations that we've seen in the year. We look at the prior year uh, uh, projects that, that we did not get to, things of that nature. And, and you know, the, the hot button areas, the hot topic areas that would um, hopefully not prevent the superintendent and the board from achieving their goals. And because certain areas for the blueprint, um, the superintendent has made clear uh, her priorities and the board as well, uh, we, we discuss it as, as a staff at staff meetings. We go through our executive leadership uh, called ELT and we make those those final decisions. There's there's no way that we could do 400 and some audits in, in a year. 
So we also look at the uh, areas, the divisions, and which areas come out um, as higher risk. And there are some divisions just by their inherent nature that are considered higher risk than others. Uh, so we take a lot of variables and factors in, into consideration. And then we also follow um, our professional guidance, which is, is the Red Book for uh, governmental auditors. Sure. And as you know, the board relies on the independent judgment of you and your team in the ultimate outcome and, and that judgment of what it is we choose to audit. And our org chart is structured as such, um, the independence of your office, um, a reflection of that, so that the ultimate decision is truly yours um, and your office's to make that call in terms of what projects um, and, and what that work plan looks like. So my question is, um, in your professional best judgment, does this work plan reflect your independence and did you feel you had that latitude to make that call and does this work plan reflect that? Yes. I think, Thank you. I think the importance of uh, considering feedback from the board, feedback from the superintendent, feedback from the audit committee um, probably needs to start a little bit earlier. Uh, uh, we've taken that in, into consideration as well as far and also of, of the process owners but ultimately the uh, work plan is, is based on decisions that our office has made. We consider the feedback of these uh, different groups throughout the organization. And I've also uh, interact with others, my colleagues um, and peers throughout the state to find out what they're doing, what they have included in their work plans. I actually uh, sent out a survey to them and, and have compiled those results as well to see what their areas of focus are. Um, and I also have arranged for this, this um, coming year to have the Office of the Inspector General's Office um, do a presentation to, to the peer group to basically kind of help us understand what they're seeing and is that something that we should take into consideration um, in our work plans as well. Also, various staff development activities um, that we attend. I actually did attend something that said five audits are better than 100. So again, as we do the risk assessment uh, year after year, we're refining our processes as well and hopefully narrowing and focusing on the areas that will be very beneficial and impactful um, for the organization in accomplishing their goals. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. And, and we know that um, your focus and commitment to professional development, um, I, I wanna commend you for that um, because we've shown that consistently in the last several years. So thank you for, for your attention and, and prioritization of those activities as well as the audit activities um, and for sharing those details with us. We, we wanna make sure that you're empowered with the latitude um, to do what you need to do professionally and that you have the, the freedom and feel like you can address those hot button issues um, that, that you need to address. So I'm, I'm hearing you say that this work plan reflects that um, that's all I, I need to hear. So thank you, Ms. Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. And, and um, if I just may comment, that's why it's important to do a risk-based audit plan to address those emerging risks. And that sometimes means that something does have to give, but that would be with the approval of the audit committee if there's any, any significant changes to the work plan, approved work plan. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? Uh, good evening, Ms. Barr. Good evening. We haven't spoken in a prop approximately six weeks so she doesn't know what I'm going to say uh, <laughs> I'm going to start off by saying on a scale of one to ten and ten being the highs I have the ultimate respect for your you and your department Thank and you. I would say a 20 on a scale of ten because I, I feel that strongly about your professional knowledge and, and experience as a group so uh, I'm going to read three things real quick, three sentences from, from this document. Our, from the overview on page four, our risk-based audit plan is a multi-year plan that will allow us to focus our limited resources on audit activities that will provide recommendations to help mitigate uh, identified risks. That's the one sentence, and I cut it off. I didn't include, I knocked off the end of it. Another one is our office identifies 
and prioritize potential audits and other projects using a risk-based approach by assessing various BCPS functions. And then lastly, the flexible nature of our audit plan as a living document provides the discretion to modify projects when it is in the best interest of the board and BCPS. Now, I, I greatly appreciate the flexibility piece. I mean, that's, I think that's part of my life is, is being able to adjust things as they come along. My concern is in, in May or late, late May or early June, there were a couple audits that came, that the suggestions were made to you and your team to incorporate those into this plan. You started, if I'm not mistaken, in the end of February or March on your plan. And I personally think that at that timing was, was in the ninth hour to introduce these audits. And, and I'm, I'm concerned about, about you being caught, you and your team sort of being caught in the middle between the superintendent and between the board and between, you know, BCPS. My vision, uh, my interpretation is that you're an independent group that sits out here, that takes recommendations from people and receives them and evaluates that. But the timing on these two particular audits was really disturbing to me. Mr. McMillian, the, 20 more seconds. The okay, just because what happened was you ended up, have, you, you accepted those two, and then uh, several others that had gone through the entire lengthy process were bumped. And that's my concern, and I won't be voting for the work plan and its current state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McMillian. Any other questions from the board? So I have a few questions. And so given the limited resources, and we really want to maximize our return on investment, how are we minimizing redundancies and reviews? So we have an Office of Investigation here with human resources. Um, the Maryland State Department of Education sends expert review teams out into schools around a lot of the blueprint work. There's other monitoring around like title funds and all of that that comes from external entities. And so how are we ensuring that we're not being redundant in um, the audits that we are doing? Yeah, that's one of the things that we don't do is redundancy. So we, we validate and make sure that those other groups um, are not doing the same thing that we intend to do, um, and if, if so, then, then we back off. And I'll give you a case in point. We had a, a, a project in the work plan, and through the information gathering process, we discovered that it is so heavily regulated and monitored by external agencies and external groups. They get this report card. They sent, submit a corrective action plan. That is exactly what we would do. So we said, we wrote a memo and said, we're not doing that this year, probably never, because it's so heavily monitored and regulated. Um, so we take all of that into consideration. Uh, we know that the external audit group that does the annual financial report and the single audit, we don't do that same type of, of review or level of work that they do. Um, so external audit groups look at things a little bit differently than internal audit groups do. But we always look at that and make sure that there is a lack of redundancy. And if there is, we, we would back off. Um, with respect to the Office of Investigations in the Department of Human Resources, our office focuses on um, uh, fraud, waste, and abuse. You might have heard me mention earlier on that um, anything that comes through the hotline that is non-fraud, waste, or abuse, all of those now are submitted to the superintendent's office uh, for their review and disposition, and, th and then we get a confirmation email back to say that it has been given to the appropriate individual or individuals uh, to follow up on, and, and then we're provided with that result. Um, and the Office of Investigations and HR, uh, from, from, from what I understand, is that they, they in investigate more of person-to-person of -person types of things, like uh, abuse or harassment, bullying, things of that nature. We don't do that. We have a very good working relationship with the um, Office um, of Investigations in the Department of Human Resources. We will send things their way. They will say, they will contact us and say, hey, is this something that you would look into? And we tell them yes or we tell them no. 
Okay, so when I look at the board policy 8340 and I look at our board handbook, they, they both talk about um, the role of the audit office. And in both of these documents, they emphasize the, the fiscal portion of, of your role, that there is, um, that you're, you have, the policy highlights these uh, fiduciary oversight responsibilities. But then when I look at the current plan, um, and, and I see some of that sprinkled in this current plan, but then when I look at something like what's under the Division of Curri Curriculum and Instruction, how does that uh, connect to the fiscal auditing roles of um, the, the office? Well, budget dollars are spent on, on <coughs> programs, and so if we're doing an audit related to a measurement of, of effectiveness to make sure that the, that the office or the program is, is successful in achieving its goals, then that makes sense perhaps to continue and uh, to continue the program in the organization, um, which then ties to the dollars, if you will. Um, not everything is gonna be financially related because we do different types of audits. There are financial <coughs> audits, there are performance audits, there are compliance audits, so it's, it's a smattering of all types of audits that are included in the plan. Now when we go to the schools, we'll be doing more of, of financial types of audits and as we, as we learn more of, about the offices and, and the various programs, um, we would have to put our focus where it belongs. Sometimes it is with the dollars, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a safety issue um, or a safety matter. Sometimes with student enrollment, we did a student enrollment audit. That ties, that ties to the dollars. Um, so, and it, so it, it just depends. So your staff is trained to do safety audits, to do curriculum audits, to do all those different audits, or is it mostly training in the, the financial piece? They're trained, they're trained to do audits, just in general. We take a lot of, of, of staff development uh, activities. We have uh, a variety of individuals that have a lot of different certifications. We have uh, CPAs in the office. We have certified fraud examiners in the office. Um, uh, certified business managers, certified government auditing professionals. So whatever comes our way, we have the responsibility in accordance with Red Book to, to become familiar with and learn whatever it is that, that we're auditing. And the one um, thing that I have um, is in the last 20 seconds is when we say that if a program are, is effectively implemented, just how do we define effectively? Um, and what measures are being used, and then what are the qualifications of the person who's assigning that measure. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's an important piece in here, and I do agree with Ms. Harvey um, and Ms. Hinn that I do feel like there needs to be a prioritization um, so that we know what's being audited, wh when the audit reports are coming, and, um, and when. Okay. Um, so with respect to um, the performance measures. Performance measures are, are um, noted in, in the budget book. The process owners identify uh, the measurements that they use and, and they, tell, they tell us. We don't, s and then based on whatever their benchmarks are or whatever is, is that they have to be compliant with, that's our measurement of effectiveness. If, if they say we're gonna do A, B, and C, and they don't do A, B, and C, then you know, we report on that. But if they're doing what they say that they're going to do, then hopefully that is a measurement of their effectiveness. But we don't identify their measurements of effectiveness. We learn that from the process owners or from any information that is available out there related to, to the programs. With respect to um, prioritization, I am working on um, presenting that at the September Audit Committee uh, with, re with regard to when the audits will be completed. Um, it's, it's important to keep in mind that we do look at the time of year and when things are happening. For example, open enrollment and benefits is, is usually September, October, November. We would not interfere with that process uh, during that time. So it's a challenge for us sometimes to figure out when it makes sense to do the audit and that's why we do work with the process owners closely um, to say, is it okay for us to come in now? Because this is when we're considering doing the audit. But if we're aware, like when there's testing going on at the schools, we take that into consideration. We would not be out at the schools during that time if it doesn't make sense. Um, Ms. Frempong. Good evening, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Ms. Farr. Good evening. 
I would concur with um, Mr. McMillian when he talks about the amount of respect um, as far as you leading your team and what you guys do. Um, from the time that I have um, been on the committee, on the audit committee and working with you, um, I definitely see the, the area of expertise and the skills that you guys have. So we appreciate this most recent plan. Um, I wanted to actually, I guess, just kind of ask some questions and speak to some comments that had been made um, because to me, there is an impression that certain things were being added at the last minute and that your team didn't have opportunity to review or do a risk assessment um, properly. And so going back and looking at some of the communications, when the suggestions were given, um, it was that you were going to go still through your risk assessment and determine if it was high, medium, or low risk, and then if it was deserving to add that to the next year's plan. And so I think you've spoken on it already, but I guess I just want to reinforce and confirm what I'm hearing. Was there any difference in how you assessed those projects? Was there any shortcuts, for lack of a better word, in assessing those projects, or did they still go through the same process that you applied to the other projects? Yes, we, we, we considered um, the risk associated with the projects that were brought forward to us through the feedback received from others. I also want to comment and make sure that the board knows and understands that it is mentioned in the Red Book and also <coughs> in policy that we are supposed to get feedback from um, the board, from the audit committee, from the superintendent, from executive leadership, and that's what we do. And this year we recognize and realize that we have to start the process a little bit earlier, earlier on, and, and that's what we're doing. Um, you know, it was, a lot of things were new to new people, um, uh, last year and so that was a, a little bit of a shortcoming perhaps on um, my judgment to think that people knew and understood what they needed to do and when they needed to do it so we're considering all the feedback I want to be clear that it, it is our work plan based on information and feedback that we've received from the folks that we have supposed to take that, that feedback from and considered was the timing of it the greatest when the information and feedback was received? Honestly, it wasn't, but we're, we worked through it and um, we've included and incorporated some of the requests that made sense to us, again, based on the review process that we have, um, feedback that I've received from my colleagues throughout the state and the state of Virginia, and we've incorporated the feedback, again, in accordance with the Red Book practices and how we're supposed to do it the, the failure, if you will, is, is the timing of when the specific feedback was received, but, but we did it, and I think it's a good plan. I think it's uh, gonna be beneficial to the organization, and as we work with the process owners this year, there may be other projects uh, that, that come off and others that, that go on. Um, and again, that's why we do a risk-based plan, because we have that flexibility to put things in and take things out. And as long as we're communicating, which we do every month at the audit committee, and I, I do every month with the superintendent um, and other chiefs you know, in the organization, I, I value the um, ability to communicate that. And as long as we're doing that and, and it's everybody's on board with it, then the changes will be made. And if, it, and if everybody isn't and it's not approved, then the changes won't be made. But again, back to Ms. Booker Dwyer's point about redundancy, I mean, the project that we removed, we have uh, documentation to support that. And that is what will be presented to the audit committee for removal of the project. So I just wanna be clear that it is our plan. It's not the superintendent's plan, it's not the board's plan, it's not the audit committee's plan, it's not the process owner's plan. It is a combination of all that going through our risk assessment process applied and using our judgment to say, this is what we feel is the best this year for uh, the organization. And as we go through the year and we, we learn more information, we, we may have gotten it wrong in some cases. And, and it's okay to say we got it wrong and we're not gonna do that, we're gonna do this instead. Uh, Ms. Hinn and then Ms. Harvey. Uh, Thank Ms. you. Hinn. Yes. Um, I appreciate Madam Chair's comments um, drawing us back to the policy on the purpose of 
the internal audit function and the focus on the financial aspect of the audits to be performed. And I, while I understand that there is a fiscal impact on the audits, whether they're financial in nature or not, when we talk about a risk assessment, that conjures up the financial impact of all of the different types of audits we perform, whether they're financial in nature or not. And it would seem to me that, and I've questioned this since I've joined the board, that those projects with the greatest fiscal impact would rise um, to the top in terms of prioritization should they have a greater fiscal impact on the organization as a whole. And I question projects such as school activity fund accounting when you look at the overall um, fiscal picture in, in terms of how significant is that overall versus looking at larger budget items, right? And some other projects that the board has, has I wouldn't want to say question because that presents the wrong ideas if there's an issue to be examined and that's not the case. But Ms. Barr, could you speak to your risk assessment process and where um, fiscal prioritization comes into play and how projects such as the school, and I know we've discussed this in the past, but how projects such as school activity fund accounting would rise in terms of prioritization versus other higher dollar amount projects that would seem to present a greater risk should there be any fraud, waste, or abuse? Mm -hmm. So there's all types of risk. There obviously is financial risk. There's reputational risk, things of that nature. With respect to school activity funds, the dollar amount is immaterial, but the reputational risk to the organization, if something would come, come up that a bookkeeper or a teacher or whomever stole $50,000 from students, um, the, the dollar amount is low, uh, but the reputational risk to the organization is high. So there's all different types of risks that are taken into consideration. And again, it's not just um, the financial piece, if you will. Uh, we're, we're gonna be concentrating and focusing as well on uh, payroll um, at the schools and looking more as we're uh, implementing the new ERP system, not so much this year, but we know that it's, that it's up and coming. So we know that there are things out on the horizon that we're gonna look at that might have a, a greater financial impact, if you will, to the organization. But you have to keep in mind that it's not always uh, a financial risk. It's it could be a reputational risk, um, a programmatic risk, things of that nature. Ms. Harvey. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Barr. Um, thank you in advance for your patience as I try to understand uh, process. So in determining uh, what you're going to audit in whatever time frame, your first step is to survey the process owners. Is that correct? Correct, okay, and then the process owners complete a survey or provide you feedback in whatever manner, and then you conduct a risk assessment on the feedback you've been given? Correct. And is the risk assessment a uh, Institute of Internal Auditors, like, Risk assess is a to an actual tool that that those things go through, and depending on what the risk level is from the results of implementing the tool, you then decide the order in which you're going to um, execute those audits. But the but that determination foundationally is based on the process owners input into um, what they see as a risk. So they say we, s we see, you know, the color blue as a risk, then you're looking at assessing is blue a risk, but we're not looking at orange or red or yellow because they didn't identify it? We take that into consideration, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the board? Okay. 
Do I have a motion to approve the FY 2025 Office of Internal Work Plan as presented in Exhibit H2? So moved, Young. Do I have a second? If there's no second. Second from Paul. Any discussion, any additional discussion? Good. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Ten? No. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? No. Ms. Chikakalu? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Harvey? No. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? No. We have seven yeses. Seven. So the motion passes. Okay, thank you, Ms. Barr. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the work session on the proposed FY 2026 state capital budget request. And for that, I call on Dr. Grimm. Good evening, uh, Board Chair Booker Dwyer, uh, Vice Chair Ms. Hum Ms. Pumphrey, uh, Superintendent Dr. Rogers and members of the board. Uh, Ms. Lazari and I are here this evening to um, answer any questions that you have on the state capital budget for FY26 that was presented at last board meeting. Uh, one notation for you, um, with the board's approval of the overly site for the Northeast Area High School at the last meeting, uh, I believe it's item number six, has been changed to include that notation. Any, you have more to present? Is that no, ma'am, that's it. Okay, any, uh, any other discussion? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is the report on highly effective teachers and leader, leaders and staff, the hiring update number five, and for that I call on Dr. Rogers. Good evening, Board Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and members of the board. Mr. McCall is going to be joined by Ms. Stansberry uh, shortly to provide our uh, final hiring update before the opening of schools, well, one day after we started schools. Um, we are very excited about the results of all of the efforts from not only human resources um, staffing team, but really the work of all of the divisions, really working together as well as our external partners across uh, Baltimore County who have partnered with us to um, help us find highly qualified staff members uh, to um, be inside of our classrooms with our students starting yesterday. I will not steal his thunder, but I will <laughs> say for the first time in a very long time, we are in double digit vacancies uh, having 9,000 teachers on the books, double digit vacancies. So Mr. McCall. Perfect segue, thank you so much Dr. Rogers. Uh, of course, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and members of the board. Um, I am not flying this plane solo tonight. I do have my co-pilot here, <laughs> Susan Stansberry, who has uh, undoubtedly beat my record. I'm going to say it once again, uh, but I will say this and I will share this with you. A couple of weeks ago, um, when Dr. Rogers gave a superintendent's update on the hiring process, uh, we walked out after the board meeting and I shared with her, I said, oh, you did such a great job. 
we don't have to worry about the next update, right? And I said, 98%. She said, oh, absolutely not. You still will be presenting tonight. So with that said, of course, if it was at 98%, and she thought we, as part of that conversation that we would actually exceed that at 98%. So if you could put the uh, slide up, please. And with that said, we're at 99% staff. So of course. <laughs> enough to get your breath in? Okay, good. <laughs> so at 99% staffed, then of course we have approximately 70 uh, vacancies remaining across the system, uh, with 70% of our schools that do not have any vacancies, with that 96% of our schools have two or fewer vacancies. Of course that is with all the hard work, the determination, and the grit from the Office of Staffing with the officers led by the lady who actually broke my record yet again. I'm gonna keep saying that. Ms. Susan Stansberry, the uh, Director of Staffing. And with that, I'll turn it over to Susan who will share the next slide, please. Thank you, Juan. Uh, we definitely have a great, a great staff in the area of staffing and uh, they've worked very hard this summer. We do still have some areas of need. Our greatest needs would be in special education and math. We have put some things in place in order to help support as best we can where those vacancies are. Um, we do have um, staff who are both um, central office as well as school-based um, certificated special educators um, to help with additional um, case management and have been offered additional pay for that. We do have, um, we're seeking contractual and have had good feedback from candidates for some contractual workers for 16 hours a week to supplement as well. Um, we are continuously looking internally and externally for additional individuals with bachelor's degrees who could become conditionally licensed. Mm -hmm. And then we also are working at looking at where we can hire additional paraeducators as support um, for those classrooms. As far as where the math vacancies are, um, the things that we have really um, worked with schools to supplement would be working obviously with teleeducation services where we have some great long term uh, partnering with online learning programs where they um, can help support schools by teaching through online at the, you know, in a school classroom though. And also um, current teachers are able to pick up additional, an additional class for either the semester or the year for additional pay as well. Next slide please. With this, what you <laughs> also saw a few weeks ago was one of four of the uh, commercials that we have par I've actually partnered with, with WBAL, with the Partnership on Communications as well, uh, with iHeartMedia, to share these commercials, as you may have seen some of them, but, but we, I'm not gonna share the same one that the superintendent shared a few weeks ago, but this one here, where you'll see uh, one of our uh, teachers who actually was a career changer, and also one who is currently in the system, but also has found an opportunity for promotion within the system. So not only do we bring it up as a way of retaining, we also provide opportunities for promotion as we go out to recruit. And with that said, would you please run the video? Attention, are you looking to make a difference in the lives of our children? Baltimore County Public Schools wants you. I came to teaching sort of as a second career. Been here in Baltimore County for 24 years now. It's been a good journey. I would say come to Baltimore County because of the support that you give. If you're a recent grad or a teacher looking to relocate or maybe changing careers and teaching is your new passion, Baltimore County Public Schools is eager to talk to you. For more information, contact us and experience the benefits of BCPS. Two reasons for sharing. Are you? Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Two reasons for sharing that video. Once, of course, talking about the promotional opportunities, but then also uh, the one who was a career changer who has been with us for a number of years. I'm not wearing my bow tie tonight, so I decided to share that one tonight. Uh, but then in addition to that, as I said before, just those opportunities for promotion within the system uh, to, as a means of retaining or retention. Uh, with that said, the last slide was to say thank you and if there are any questions. Well, thank you for all the work that you are doing. And I see the commercials running on WBAL and it just warms my heart. And I'm glad that for such a large school system to have a vacancy rate that low, that is that truly speaks to the work that is happening in our school system. So thank you for that. Thank you. Ms. Dominowski. Just kind of a cosmetic question, but um, the commercial, was that footage from like inside B all BCPS schools? 
Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, we actually, to share the location, it was actually Lions Mill. Okay. Um, that was done f earlier, maybe in July, uh, around that time. But then finally they got the, the commercials together and pieced them up. But all of them were at Lions Mill, and there, there were five teachers total, uh, from secondary to elementary, uh, ranging as uh, you saw with the one was the, actually at that time it was the department chair of uh, social studies at Pikesville and I believe uh, Mr. Brotman was actually the, um, and I guess it's okay because they're actually sharing the video now, but <laughs> was, is a career navigator at Towson High School. But the, all the, like the little clips, wherever, like they're showing yes. students in the classroom, that, that's all? Oh, 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 I see what you're saying. Some of that was some of the other right. That's actually other footage that was pulled in. But the actual teachers themselves were in the uh, with were actually at Lions Mill on location. Was but there any consideration in, in like getting our students in there and going to BCPS schools? As a matter of fact, we talked about that, but of course we have to get clearance from the parents to actually share their images and likeness. Okay, yeah. thank you, mm -hmm. sure. Miss Frimpong. trying to figure out how to come off of mute. Um, this is, is wonderful, and I'm glad to see these numbers um, going into the school year. So my question is the demographics or the makeup of these teachers that we have hired. Um, so we know with Blueprint Pillar 2, we have high quality and diverse teachers and leaders as one of the pillars. And so do we have the data or the breakdown of the demographics of the teachers that have come into the system? So with that, uh, we are certainly, as we're hiring them, of course, uh, we can't ask that information on the application, but as they are uh, completing their I-9 uh, process, they are completing that, but that will be some information that we don't have presently here on site with us, but of course, if the superintendent wants to weigh in, we'll be happy to decide, you know, or of course, let her decide who, if and when we can share that with you all. Thank you, Ms. Frimpong, for that question. As a part of our update on the pillars, we will um, present um, in accordance with our targets around um, hiring for highly diverse staff. Uh, as Blueprint requires, we will be presenting that data to the full board. Mm -hmm. And so what are the, the targets that you mentioned? Uh, the targets around pillar two, the requirements for all LEAs to recruit a highly diverse um, teaching and administrative staff. Yeah, so, I, okay, so I guess my question is more, do we have numbers or do we have goals that we have set as far as what those numbers are? Yes, we have some, uh, we have numbers in terms of where we were as part of equity committee work um, that occurred uh, last year, I believe. Uh, there were conversations about uh, targets and goals. Targets and goals were shared uh, with the board by uh, disaggregated by position type. And in the fall, I believe, is where we have scheduled in the schedule of board meetings to provide an update on staffing, the demographics of staffing in accordance with the blueprint. Okay, thank you. So I guess I will see the numbers at that time. But I guess one thing to consider because um, as we talk about having a highly diverse um, teachers and staff in the system, I think at the last count or the, mm, the numbers, they were around 87% um, were white female teachers in our system. And so I, it's not that I expect that that's gonna just change overnight. Um, we may be at the, the exact same numbers. But if we are bringing in um, the same amount of, of teachers, are we looking at, or is there any type of qualification or um, I guess screening to say, are these um, teachers culturally responsive or culturally proficient um, as far as being able to interact and deal with our students effectively, emotionally um, and academically? Thank you for that question. Specifically around cultural uh, responsiveness, that is, uh, training that is provided directly to um, all of our teachers. We also recertify that uh, training annually with our staff development teachers, and it is part of um, our 
uh, framework around um, high expectations that we just, June 24th, uh, when we trained the 5,497 teachers and then the follow-up with the rest on August 20th um, was specifically around that. And so we can certainly share more information, but uh, there is an expectation that we are culturally responsive, but not just as a uh, term, but unpacking what that means and what it looks like uh, with culturally responsive practices in the classroom. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is information. The first item is the 2024-2025 Special Education Staff Plan. And the last item is the Revised Superintendent's Rule 1270. The next item on the agenda is Board Committee Updates and Agenda Setting. And we will start with Committee Updates and I will start with the Audit Committee. So we are excited to kick off this, this next season of the Audit Committee's work on September 17th. Um, we, at this meeting, we will look at that year-long calendar so that we can backwards map um, when the audit work plan is due to the board and we can ensure that we get that feedback in a timely fashion. We will also incorporate the feedback from this meeting today. I've, I know I've already um, met with Ms. Barr and we talked about um, prioritizing the list and, um, and just making some modifications to, to the work plan, to, to future work plans, so that the board is really clear on um, just the prioritization. Um, Ms. Barr talked a little bit about how, um, you, know, five, uh, you know, focusing on five audits over 100, so just kind of right-sizing the number of audits. So we're gonna look at some of the data that um, to, to see what is the, the closure rate on audits so that we can right-size the work plan to mirror what has been, um, done in the past so that we're not too ambitious, we're not, um, we're not un under ambitious, I don't know, and um, we're just right, so it's that Goldilocks approach. So, um, so I'm looking forward to September 17th at 4.30 p.m. And for the next um, committee update, we will go to building and contracts with Mr. Young. The next building and contracts meeting is scheduled for Monday, September 9th. Starting at 4.30, we will have a presentation on the Patapsco High School edition, and we will start the regular meeting at 5 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Our next update is Curriculum Committee, and for that I go to Ms. Lichter. Um, yes, we had a meeting just last week, and our next one is on the 19th of September, um, and we are also working on our measures of effectiveness was to put together um, some of the minimum requirements that board members would like to, s committee members would like to see when information is presented so we are um, currently working on that thank you equity committee Ms. Frimpong thank you so um, I'm currently serving as the chair of the equity committee and Ms. Harvey is uh, serving as the vice chair of that committee our next meeting will be on Thursday September 12th from 4 to 5 30 just the equity committee and then on September 26th from 5.30 to 6.30, it will be the equity committee meeting with the advisory. Um, Ms. Harvey and I, we will be reviewing previous years of the equity metric um, reports. And um, we're also gonna be meeting with um, Dr. Rogers um, and looking at how do we use these reports or data to guide our work across this 24-25 school year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next committee, Legislative and Governmental Relations. Um, so we are looking forward to having our first meeting on November 6 at 4.30 p.m. So you'll get more information about that meeting um, the closer we get to that date. Policy Review Committee, Ms. Pumphrey. Our first meeting is scheduled for Monday, September 16th. And just as a reminder, um, the policies that are scheduled for review this cycle are posted on the website. Thank you, Ms. Pumphrey. And what you'll see posted in board docs are our um, are the 2024 board committees, their purpose and measures of effectiveness. So this is something we um, that all the committees have been working on all last year, um, and we're looking forward to implementing um, that this year. 
So next is agenda items. Board members, please raise your hand to indicate if you have any items for consideration. Ms. Dominowski. Yes, um, I wanted to see if we, uh, if we could see how we are utilizing our outside charitable organizations and foundations to our greatest advantage to help our students in school climate. We've heard several speakers over the last year from HBCU representatives, NAACP chapters, fraternal orders, Big Brother, Big Sisters, those types of things, et cetera. We also have some amazing local organizations with access to charitable funds that would love to get involved. They just need direction. I think we're um, underutilizing some of our greatest assets in our area. And if we could get them more involved in schools where maybe you know some parents aren't able to be as active, it would help our kids. Also, happy birthday, Mom. Thank you. We will build that into the agenda. Any other board members? Okay. So the next board meeting, nothing is loading. Yes. So the next board meeting is Tuesday, September 10th at what? Um, t September 10, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight and have a great evening. The meeting is now adjourned.